Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this new series of Centro Events Cafecito Con. My name is Angel Antonio Ruiz, and I'm the Director of Arts and Culture at Centro. Cafecito Con will be a relaxed space for conversation with some of our most important voices, writers, artists, activists, and community leaders. We're happy and honored that our first cafecito tonight will be with Willy Perdomo, Puerto Rican writer, poet, professor, editor, and prominent intellectual, recently designated New York Poet Laureate. And if it wasn't enough, Willie will be in conversation with our dear friend and fellow poet, Ura Joan Noel. After the conversation, we will have time for a Q&A. So you can, you, you can write your comments and questions in the Q&A section. Please join me in a warm welcome to our friends, Willie and Ura Joan. Buenas noches, everybody. Bienvenidos. Welcome to Centro. It's an honor, a joy, and a pleasure to be here in conversation with the great Willie Perdomo. And uh, Willie, I just wanted to start off uh, congratulating you on uh, becoming, uh, I think, the first Latinx person of any kind, right? Not just Afro Latino, right? Uh, well, no, de definitely the first Puerto Rican state poet, <laughs> poet in New York, for sure. That's for sure. And the first one from East Harlem, too. Uh, we should say that, too. So. Fantastic, fantastic. So uh, I wonder if you have had a chance to reflect on the significance of that, right? As someone who has represented New York so consistently and so forcefully in your work for such a long time, right? But a particular New York, very much situated, right? In a kind of personal history that's also an expansive history. Uh, how does it feel to um, uh, represent, right, New York State uh, more generally, right, and think about uh, the connections, right, that your, your work has made across New York communities. Yeah, I mean, when I look at the, uh, when I received the citation, and, uh, and it was official at the very end, uh, they say you we designate you State Poet of New York for, you know, 2021 to 2023. And because I've been talking about this over the last couple of weeks, I've done some school visits and um, I've been able to reflect on the, the journey. So when I start thinking about music and how was, that was like the first kind of narrative that I would hear, you know, we would go to these parties and at barrio and social clubs for a birthday, baby shower, a death, and the kids would, we would fall asleep with this music sort of boogaloo and salsa music sort of coming through my dream life. So that's the first stories that I'm really hearing. And then my mother's stories in the, in the living room. Then I open the window and I start to see the world outside of my window, more narrative happening. Then you come down to the stoop and you're playing in front of the stoop. More stories to be told on the stoop. Epic tales, by the way, uh, serialized tales as well. Uh, tall tales, right? The vernacular starts to take place and the vernacular is informed by legend, myth, uh, drums. Then you get from the stoop and then you walk down to the street corner. And that's when the stories start to take on a little bit more um, a profane uh, uh, thrust, <laughs> you know, um, a rhythmic thrust. You understand by the time you get to the corner how the stories start to come out of your body because your body is so emotive as you're telling the story. Then you take the train and you go downtown and, you know, you go to school and you start reading. Books have always been uh, a portal. Um, the very first lesson that I've ever really, really learned about uh, being a poet really didn't happen in the classroom and didn't happen in the, in the library, didn't happen through a book, any poems I read, but it was on the five train going uptown. I was with um, Ed Randolph and Ed Randolph was a receptionist at the school that I attended, French seminary. And, um, you know, he would, we would ride uptown together. I would get off on 125th street and at the time he was living in the Bronx and um, there was one day, one evening, 
um, we were on the train and he says, you're going to, you're going to feel um, the train pull in to 125th Street. The tracks are going to switch and you're going to feel it sort of tug you. That was the very first lesson I learned as a poet. And I remember being on the train, it was rush hour. And the lesson that I learned was to concentrate. And so, so what you do is you sort of black out all the noise. You black out all the hub, you, all the hum. Um, and you close your eyes and you concentrate. And you feel that, that tug under your feet as the train pulls into 125th Street. So the first lesson I learned was sort of concentration. That, those were lessons that I learned, that, you know, being introduced to Ed as a poet, reading Langston Hughes at school. And then you go to college and then you come back to the city and then you hit the stage. Um, so all that to say, basically, that from that moment that I'm falling asleep sleep and hearing those that music come through my dreamscape, all the way to this moment where I'm talking to you now, uh, the journey has been pretty fantastic. And to be from 122nd Street in Lexington, from East Harlem, from El Barrio, to be Afro Boricua, to be, you know, um, the first Puerto Rican state poet of New York, the first Latinx state poet of New York, to be in the company that I'm keeping uh, on that list is for me uh, a great honor. And you, you can only, you know, you have to reflect on that particular journey, but I've been able to do so more so uh, these days because I've been talking about what it means to be uh, a poet laureate. So the journey has been pretty cool. Fantastic. Congratulations. And thank I you, man. Mention uh, concentration, right? I, I think back to uh, the late great Miguel Algarín, right? Founder of the New Rican Poets Cafe. He has that, uh, that insistence that the poet has to concentrate the passersby into a listening body, the way the salsa band does. When you see a band on the street and everything just stops and everybody just uh, congregates around the band. So I love that the, the city itself, right, is, is the space that, um, that makes possible a kind of poetic um, concentration. It's great because I was yeah. gonna ask you a Harlem question, but you kind of answered it for me. So uh, along those lines, I'm wondering if you could say more about um, being uh, black and Boricua, right? In the context of, uh, you know, the many bridges in your work, right? And mm -hmm. one thing I think that's distinctive about your work is uh, just in the context of Puerto Rican writing, um, the, you know, the connections that you make between say, uh, the New Rican tradition, right? Folks like Fernandez Cruz or Peter Thomas, right? Sandra Maria Estevez, uh, Algarín even, um, but then also you're in, in touch with Mayra Santos Febres, right, and folks in, in Puerto Rico, right? So, so from the space of, of being, uh, you know, Black and, and Puerto Rican, uh, your work seems to have really um, uh, investigated, right, seems to investigate, right, a lot of different histories and traditions and forms. And I wonder if you could say more about that, uh, thinking that it's also Black History Month and of right. the... Uh, uh, the project, right, the, the unfinished project of someone like Arturo Schomburg, right, in the sense that we need to be doing that dust of digging, right, for these kind of counter histories. Uh, and then also uh, thinking in Centro, right, we have someone like Jesus Colon, right, who's, uh, whose work is so fundamental. Um, so your, your uh, work seems to me ideal in terms of thinking of all these convergences. And I wonder if you wanted to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, part of that has to do definitely from be, being uh, from East Harlem to begin with. You know, there's no question about growing up in East Harlem in the 70s and the 80s into the early 90s that if you grew up in East Harlem, you basically were growing up in a Puerto Rican and African American um, experience. I think about the idea of what happens when we trans create, when we, uh, the transnational sort of idea of being in flux between identities. Um, which is something that I've been reflecting on as well. I think the first model I really had for um, the coordinates, right? So, and uh, Juan Flores sort of sets up these coordinates for what it means to be Afro um, 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 Latinx, right? And uh, it's not so much an ancestral thing, even though there's so many of us that can claim that, but it's be it becomes a, um, a sort of uh, how you work your way into the history of the letters. So once I develop my own artistic prerogatives, then I need a form of expression for that. And my first form of expression for that was 
probably Pidi Tomas when that really that classic chapter in Gandhi's Mean Streets where he says, um, you know, brothers under the skin or when he goes with brew down south and he doesn't know that he's actually back until he gets down south. And then his whole world is transformed because his identity has now just been, is taken out of his control. So um, part of that was how do I relate to that? Because I was experiencing the same thing, navigating uh, uh, worlds between say, you know, at Barrio and then going downtown to uh, a prep school. And, you know, I was a kid who was plucked out of a public school and, you know, given a scholarship to, to go to, these, to this school and thinking about how my identity now is also being perceived like people didn't understand that somehow I was Puerto Rican until I spoke Spanish. So they probably thought of me as a young black man and then interaction with police officers, because, you know, if you think about, you know, the late eighties and late nineties, especially if I'm listening to stories uh, on the corner, if you will, then there's going to be um, a certain relation to those correctional for uh, forces to see how you are identified. I thought Schomburg was probably one of the big, big exemplars of of, of that uh, Afro bodyguard. He was very, very into the documentation uh, of that life. Um, but again, the way those markers sort of at first they're sort of taken from you, it feels like that, right? You don't you you think the whole world is Puerto Rican. You think the whole world is black because of where you live, right? Uh, and then you start to find out different. As a poet, I started touring internationally. So blackness took on to get a whole nother definition depending on where I was I was traveling. So um, you know, I think uh, Dal Mayanos Figueroa is, on, uh, is, is in the house right now. And I think we're going to do a uh, cafecito with her soon. And, you know, the, the experience of fictionalizing that world, the, the experience of how to um, express that world when you are um, in between identities, if you will, when you're trying to navigate um, those coordinates. Um, and that definitely made its way uh, into the work. The beautiful thing about being in that space is that you have more than one language to work with. And that's really the, the richness of, of the tradition that, um, that I inherited. I think my entry point to um, poetry was through initially, initially the Harlem Renaissance poets, starting from Langston Hughes all the way on. And then after that, it was the Black Arts Movement. My great, the mentor, my mentor, Raymond R. Patterson was down with the Umbra Poets as was Victor Hernandez Cruz when he first got his start with, you know, the classic mimeograph chapbook. I think it was called Papo Got His Gun. So automatically I wanted in on that when I heard that, you know, the title Papo Got His Gun. I was like, I need to read this, right? So there was that dialogue I think that was happening. And I saw the true alliance living in these Harlem um, for sure there was no doubt that it had stopped being at least for a certain time that it had stopped being about the racial construction more about what it meant to be living uh, under the um, and on the poverty level and that was something that really connected uh, the races uh, where, where I grew up um, but once I found the Harlem Renaissance and once I found the Black Arts and the Umber Poets and then I found the classic, classic anthology put together by Idarín and Pinero, the New York School of Poetry, and 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 Idarín by that point lays out the groundwork for what it actually meant to be a New York poet. Poet. Then I had enough to work with that I can be in conversation um, with this tradition as a Afro Boricua poet uh, in the world. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I was in conversation with Victor last night, and he. He commented that those poems and Papo got his gun aren't very good. Uh, yeah. and, you know, <laughs> I'm sure. Like, 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 <laughs> but I thought, I, so I love that you're, uh, you know, telling us a different history, right? And, and I think of, of your work in that way. You kind of excavate uh, these uh, uh, these really, really unique texts. So I think what you're doing in the Shorty Bombom book, right, with mm -hmm. uh, a kind of underground history of right uh salsa latin jazz but even beyond those labels kind of experimental sound rooted in the african diaspora right taking uh that history and kind of remixing it uh uh 
So, so I think music is a really interesting analog for how you do that in your own work. And I think of you also as a kind of musical, um, you know, musical investigator. Uh, but I think we only have like 10 minutes and I want you to read a poem. Uh, but before that, I wanted to ask you about another book, uh, which is Smoking Lovely. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to ask you about that book because it kind of falls through the cracks, right? Uh, your mm -hmm. first book, where Nicole costa dying. Right? <laughs> yeah, no pun intended, debut. right? It falls through the cracks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big time debut, right? Right, Norman, right. right? It got a lot of love. <laughs> then with um, the Shorty Bon Bon book, I think it was a National Book Critics Circle finalist. It reflected a, a kind of mature Willy Perdomo, right? And that work has continued in, in, in your more recent books. Um, but so you recently reissued, right? Uh, uh, that Smoking Lovely book. Uh, and I know it's a book you have a complicated relationship to personally and poetically. Uh, I know that's some, somehow reflected in the way you remixed uh, that book and also as a little bochinche, right? Uh, uh, um, you know, I reached out to you when I was working on my book, right? And and you, you uh, on New York and poetry, and you did not seem very excited to talk about smoking lovely in particular, right? And so I wonder if you could uh, just say more about where that book, which was Radapalix Press, so it was a kind of indie book within kind of the broader trajectory of your work. Um, you know, what does it mean to you now? Why did you reissue it? Why did you approach it the way you did? Uh, and what, how do you think it connects, right, to your work more generally? Yeah, I think I, I, I do recall you reaching out when you were working on your book, and I think I, my my uh, response was was very short. And I think I think what I said, I think the less said about smoking lovely, the better at this point, man. Take care, but also right, something like that. But um, yeah, I had a lot of misgivings about the book. I think there were I, there were so many things that I was trying to do in the book. I didn't know whether I was going to write a memoir. A set of prose poems, i.e., Paris Spleen, my own sort of Paris Spleen, I think. Um, and there were some things that I wasn't really ready to re revisit um, when it came to what I was going through um, as a poet in the world, as a human being in the world, and the level of sort of darknesses you start to uh, encounter. It's all it's all in the book, but I don't think I would have. I don't know if I would have reissued it if you if you didn't if you weren't on board to sort of introduce it because I think what what it helped me to do was kind of think about I had enough tranquility in my life by that point I had enough um, healthy embarrassment in my life by that point to sort of look back at the book and and think about how you were contextualizing it and the framework for the book that in many ways I was writing to to my time I was writing in a moment of being gentrified, uh, living in East Harlem and, and East Harlem about to go, undergo an immense level of gentrification. I was living in what it meant to be a poet, i.e. or slash spoken word artist in the sort of a commodified way by this point, uh, because most of that world started to become um, commercialized, even though that's really where I cut my teeth as a poet who was able to read his poems out loud and edit on the spot and read in you know non-traditional venues. Um, but there was some of the the work that I just felt like I was just breaking lines to just break the lines. But once I started, once I was able to revisit the book, I think you have enough distance to have the clear the clear vantage point to think about where you were in your life as a poet when you were writing this book and clearly you were about to transition, you were a little sort of thirsty for some other modes of expression that lead right into the essential hits of Shorty Bong Bong. But there's a lot of rawness, I think, in a book like Smoking Lovely. And I think the chance to add um, a short 10 minute play about spoken word artists on an international level was something that was also exciting to me. And then, of course, I was able to write an afterword for the book to really, really reflect on what it meant and what misgivings I had this book. And I was able to remember, um, you know, receiving um, a phone call from uh, and this was at the point where we still had uh, house lines. I think it was in the early uh, 2000s. And um, we had received a call um, at, at the apartment and my wife, Sandra, she says, you know, I don't know who it is, but it's for you. And I get on the phone and this deep baritone voice comes on and says, he says, hey, Willie, how you doing? I say, hey, how you doing? They say, he said, it's Gil Scott, man. I just want you to tell, I want you to want to let you know that I really enjoyed the book. It's Gil Scott Heron. I'm like, oh shit, 
Gil Scott Heron called me up to tell me that he really enjoyed the book. That was a highlight. I forgot about that, right? I forgot about those moments that um, that where I was making a connection. And as you noted, that I was really ready to sort of not turn my back on my audience, but say, listen, I'm, I'm trying to go into a different direction right now. And I'm not going to depend on the poems I wrote as a kid. I'm a little older now. And I'm trying to reckon with an experience that I've, I wasn't able to sort of process in the moment. Um, and revisiting the book gave me an opportunity to, um, you know, practice my chops as a, as a playwright, a wannabe playwright as well as, as really, because, you know, all poets at one point become wannabe playwrights or wannabe, you know, novelists and, um, and it was able, I was able to, to think about the essay as a way of, of um, reflecting on a book that I wasn't really too happy about, but um, I knew that I was on a journey to, to, to somewhere else. Beautiful. Uh, well, I think on a, on a personal uh, front, I think I was there at the book party, I think at bar 13, right? That's and, right. And shout, out to, shout out to the Acentos folks if anyone's, you know, in the audience, but that book felt like a lifeline to me in the sense that it helped me understand that kind of very strange post 9-11, uh, you know, gentrified, um, you know, uh, uh, uptown, uh, um, you know, psychology, right? And, and how that uh, looped in with like the, the commod commodification, right? Of certain kinds of performance poetry, right? Your yeah. book was yeah. so frank in doing that and also so courageous, right? You could have done, uh, a kind of uh, stayed stayed in your lane and then a much right. more elegant right follow up to where an equal cost of dime, which is so wonderfully kind of canonically elegant at this point, right? Uh, and you chose to kind of the, when, when that um, band puts out the second album, right? Or the, and it's like the fu album, like uh, <laughs> it showed that's, me like that's... your 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 kind of uh, rigor as an artist, right? That you were saying I could double down and probably get props for this, but I'm going to keep pushing and do difficult work, uh, and so it feels like an important snapshot of that era, right? Uh, but also a really kind of bold example, right? Of um, you know, how to use the kind of currency of publishing, right? And, and do something different that opens up yeah. different kinds of conversations. Yeah, I mean, there was a level of resistance in that book that you tapped into without question. And, uh, you know, what the, what, the, what the world that you inhabit, what it creates and how you choose to respond to it, how you choose to write uh, in its particular time. You know, I think, I think that was that was important, and and you know the album analogy is is for me apt because every book I write is a whole different album. So you know if you go from where Nickel Costa Dime right up to the Crazy Bunch, I like to say my crazy the Crazy Bunch is my hip hop album without question, right? But it's it's a, it's a very long hip hop album too, by the way. But uh, I had a lot of fun writing it, right? So try to um, think about uh, the voice of 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 every book has a certain signature and every book inhabits a world that has its own imagination and therefore requires its own language uh, and its own vernacular. So um, yeah, so we'll see what happens with book number five if, if, if I wanna go that route. You know, it's like, I just was named the state poet of New York and every time you try to get out, they pull you back in, man, you know, so. <laughs> Well, we can't wait for book number no, five. Right. Whatever <laughs> I can't either. Project mixtape is. Uh, but on that note, we want to open it up to the Q&A, but I wonder if you would bless the virtual stage with a poem, right? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, I feel like... Uh, um, for sure. I'm going to try to make it as easy as possible for the translators, because I know there was some, you know, we didn't we didn't really have planned this in advance. So um, I'm, I'm reading a poem called, um, you know, back in the day, or at least where I grew up. And a lot of it had to do, I guess, with masculinity, right? And thinking about how to say, I love you. And sometimes it was probably the hardest thing to say in those words without being construed as weak, uh, vulnerable, you know? And so we would find different ways to say it. So for instance, if someone was talking about you know, if somebody was talking about you, would I, Your Honor, say, and maybe they were about to, you know, try to 
cast some shade on you for a second there, and I'm there, and I'm say, hold up. That's my homie right there. And then I would say, that's my heart right there, man. Don't, don't, don't talk about him like that. That's my heart right there. So I wrote a poem called, That's My Heart Right There. We used to say, that's my heart right there. As if to say, don't mess with her right there. As if don't even play, not to pardon me right there. In other words, okay, okay. That's the start of me right there. As if come that day, that's the end of me right there. As if push come to shove, I would fend for her right there. As if come what may, I would lie for her right there. As if come love to pay, I would die for that right there. Fuego. Gracias, Willy Perdomo. Thank you, man. I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you would have been my first choice to do this conversation. So I'm glad it was you when they when they uh when they when they invited me. So I know we have some questions in the chat. Uh, should I moderate the uh, um, the questions, or is there a specific order we want to take these in? Looks like no specific order, so uh, I don't know if you're able to see the the, the questions, Willie. Uh, but I'm just going in order. No, I here. can't. Yeah. Uh, so you get one from Johan Martinez. I love your poem, Head Crack, Head Crack. Can you talk a little about the process of writing this poem and inspiration? So, so it, you should know that Johan was one of my students at, at Phillips Exeter Academy. He was in my in my Diaz elective, right? I remember and. Uh, really, really talented writer. And um, I think he's out in California. I think the process for Head Crack, Head Crack, again, it, because if I say the Crazy Bunch was like my hip hop album, um, there's a song by Kanye, Most Deaf, and the kid from Philly, Free, Freeway, I think his name is. And the song is called Two Words. And I use this as a prompt in the, in a workshop in Michigan, a youth poetry workshop. I remember, I think it was 2009 or something like that. And I decided to work on the prompt myself. And that's how Head Crack, Head Crack came about. And if you see it, it's a poem written in uh, two word couplets. Each line is two word and it's written in couplets. And um, so that's part of the process, right? So how you are being informed or how you are replying to songs especially specifically hip-hop that makes your head nod so if you read head crack head crack you could nod your head to it really you could actually dance to it if 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 you read it <laughs> if you hear me read it aloud you could dance to this song so that's really what you are looking for but again it's it's a, it's a poem uh that's structured at, over uh, uh head crack is is a dice terminology for a game called CeeLo, where you just take the bank with a four, five, six, and it'd be a head crack, and you, everyone would just you would everyone would lose, and you just take everybody's money at that at that point. But and that's where I get the title from. But this, but the poem came as a response to that song called Two Words. It's a it's a really really good song with a big big beat. Beautiful, thank you. So we have a question from uh, Kevin Zeno, who asks, can you talk about what it was like working with Sonia Sanchez? And the role she plays in your life and work. Oh wow, Sonia played a big role in my trajectory as a young poet as I was introduced to the Black arts movement. And when I read Sonia's work, I knew that I was in the presence of a lioness. I knew that I was in the presence of someone clearly you know speaking truth to all the powers but also sort of invoking a higher power at the same time right up into her haikus and i you know i wrote a whole book of haikus during the pandemic and for sure i was reading sonia sanchez's uh, haiku but recently i was able to work with her at the new jersey performing arts center with um the movement revisited by christian mcbride and you know i rarely do poems or 
or spoken word over over music because it's something that you really need to reverse. But I was uh, Malcolm X to Sonia's Rosa Parks, man, and it was it was fire in that auditorium. I think anyone who had been there knew that we were sort of in a historic moment. My homie John Murillo was Martin Luther King uh, in, in in that night, and uh, just being able to um, take text. And the thing I learned during the rehearsal from Sonia was that she wasn't trying to necessarily sound like Rosa Parks. She put Sonia Sanchez into Rosa Parks and the interpretation was beautiful. And she picked her moments where she would repeat lines and, and where she would pause and sort of the intonations that she had. And I just took my cue from Sonia, like all the, all the Black Horse poets that I was privy to as a kid, especially Amiri Baraka, who loved to read uh, with music, my reading styles were all sort of, you know, we used to say in the, in the, in the hip hop graffiti world, you call them bite, you bite off this one and you bite off the other. And I was taking big chunks out of all of them basically when they were reading out loud and try to fashion my own reading style or, um, you know, on poets like Sonia Sanchez and, and Baraka for sure. So that was a highlight of my poetry life and just being able to even take a selfie with Sonia Sanchez was like, yeah, this, it was cool. It was a beautiful night. So Sonia was, had a big, big impact on, on, on my writing life as she did many young poets who were either Latinx or African-American coming through. Uh, if, when I was started coming through poets like me and you know Tony Medina and, and Kevin Powell, Ross Baraka before he became mayor, Asha Bandeli and Lorena Craighead. I mean, there was a whole group of us that we just, the dark room poets that we would just kind of converge downtown in these large, large readings at NYU. And you could see all the influences from the Black Arts, Harlem Renaissance, New York, New York School, experimental, like all of it converged into one place. Really exciting. It was almost like being part of the native tongue of poetry, you know, as opposed to hip hop. It was all there. Beautiful. I, I need to find that that recording. Uh, if it was a recording of that, uh, that sounds like yeah. There should be a recording of the thing we did with Christian. It was it was pretty cool. In fact, I can't go I I want to read some more music right now, bro. I, I'm ready to. I'm ready to read. I told Georgie Vasquez, I'm like, yo, I'm ready to do this, bro. Let's get into the studio like right now. Scenario too, all of them. I'm like, yo, I'm ready to read some poems right now to some music. So, yeah, okay. Centro, folks. Lo escucharon yeah. aquí. You heard it here. Right. Uh, get ready yeah. for. I'm doing something here today with a with a dude named Marcus Robb, and he's a has a composition, and uh, and it was I'm doing it with a student band, big band, movement about four and a half five minutes, very elegiac, and then moves into sort of a a big aggressive drum beat. So I'm I'm doing it again, and I and I look forward to doing more. Fantastic. Well, we have a question from the great Dalmayanos Figueroa, who I know will be featured here in an upcoming event. Uh, Lalma asks, at what point did you realize that writing, specifically telling stories through poems, was going to be your life? When did that consciously click in your head? Uh, the conscious click, you know, I can never, I think when I read down these mean streets, it was over, right? Because the goal was, because I was going to this school, the goal was to become, get an MBA, become a lawyer become a brain surgeon. I wasn't very good at science, but I was like, all right, maybe I could be a surgeon. I don't know, you know, but to make money. And of course I went 360 degrees. I became a poet making no money at all. Right. And uh, at least when you start out, but um, that's when I found out. after I read down these mean streets, I knew that there was no question that all those aspirations of being a professional banker, lawyer, doctor, corporate, whatever it was, were gone. They were completely swept away after I read down these mean streets. And then I said, I think I wanna write a book. And then I heard Ed Randolph. So really since ninth grade, 10th grade, I had been hitting, I got hit with the, with, with the poet bug and it has never sort of left me, you know? But having said that, I don't think I really came into a full consciousness of my practice as an artist or a writer in this world until maybe I was 40. 
you know, like a full, full, full practice of understanding what it is that I'm doing and trying to do um, at the same time. And, and what happens when you come to a full practice, it becomes an immersive proposition. Uh, you're all in. And uh, whereas before it wasn't, it didn't quite feel that way. But after when I went back to school and I started reading again and started reading for pleasure and keeping notebooks again and annotating and uh, talking about books with other folks and um, writing took on a whole different framework for me. Um, and it became more of a discipline and it became, became more of a practice for sure. And, and, and it's still ongo ongoing. Fantastic. Well, we have a question uh, maybe related to that from Tanya Ewan uh, says, uh, much of your work is a reflection of your thoughts and experiences from El Barrio. How do your current thoughts and views reflect that of your early experiences, as well as those of current life in a different socioeconomic demographic? Well, that's a big question. There's a lot in that question, I think. I mean, to begin with, you know, once I sort of started working outside of New York and I'm working in New Hampshire, then my vantage point becomes even clearer about what it meant to be from Ed Barrio, what it meant to come from a city, what it meant to be a Puerto Rican poet in this world. Um, and I think about that, instead of looking at buildings and gates and fire escapes and train tracks and you know, hearing dogs barking and police sirens and all that, now I'm looking at a tree and I'm thinking about the tree and I'm looking at the tree, but I'm really thinking about, you know, uptown. I'm thinking about dreaming with my mother now. I'm thinking about my mother asking me, you know, cause my mother passed away in December. I'm thinking about her asking me in the dream, where are you going? I'm thinking about who's asking me questions. Um, so I don't know how much, you know, the, the socioeconomic part clearly, you know, it feels great to, to, to be able to move around in this world and have access to things as you go. But all that is part and parcel of the dues that you pay as a poet in the world coming up. So if you've been around 25, 30 years without having any sense of entitlement, you see that once you pay those dues that, you know, the, the props come back around the corner and they start to meet you uh, at a nice, pleasant point in, um, in, in your poetry life. But I've never stopped being from New York. In fact, you know, you, people hear me talk. There, was a, there were a couple of um, musicians here, uh, a wind ensemble called the Imani, Imani, uh, Imani Winds. And um, one of them had heard me talk. And as soon as she heard me talk, she says, she says, I'm from Harlem too. She just told me I'm from Harlem too. And she heard it, right? So. So that, that signature, I think, is always going to be a part of, of my work. It's always going to make its way into my writing, whether I'm in, you know, whether I'm in New York City, whether I'm in New Hampshire, or Luquillo, Puerto Rico, or Peñuelas and Ponce, or whether I'm in Brixton, or wherever I seem to travel as a poet in the world, that register is always going to be part of uh, my voice and the, the voice that I that I find when I'm listening carefully to the ghosts that knock on my door. So, um, and I'm ready to meet them on their terms sometimes. And sometimes you have to reckon with them. So I don't know how much, you know, you, you, the station as, you know, you being a professor and me being a teacher and other folks on this panel might be professionals, how much that actually has to do with the artistic process when you start digging in deep to it, when you start sort of scratching and finding what's below the surface, but clearly it helps to have a place to write from uh, uh, comfortably, but how, 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 how effective that is, it, it, it remains to be seen. One of the things I miss about being in New York is that I don't have um, the ear to the, to, the, to the street anymore, the way I used to uh, as a kid. So now all my language is an imagined uh, language, a dream, uh, language, a language that's informed by things that I might be reading. I'm not necessarily picking up 
picking it up off the street. Those snaps that Victor Hernandez used, Cruz used to call, the snaps I used to pick up off the street and I would walk from 145th Street in St. Nicholas down to Lenox Avenue, down to 125th Street, down Lexington Avenue, down to 86th Street and just pick up sound, pick up imagery, pick up word, pick, pick up language as I used to as as I used to walk. But I'm not doing that anymore. So now it's interesting to see how the word might change as a result, but I'm still in it. Thank you. Well, uh, we have a question from Will at Ebeye. Uh, hello, Willy Perdomo. Thank you for your craft. Growing up in the NYC area, I often looked for Afro Puerto Ricans on the small screen, and they usually were people like journalists, Pablo Yoruba Guzman and Felipe Luciano. So who was it for you? Which Afro Puerto Rican did you admire growing up in the 1970s and 1980s? I didn't know there was such a thing as Afro Puerto Rican. Again, I thought that everybody was Puerto Rican. I thought everybody was black in the world. I really did. I thought, you know, this is real. This is a very, very real thing. Afro Puerto Rican, I didn't know what that meant until maybe my 20s or 30s. And, you know, I started thinking about that. But I feel like I would have to say maybe Tita from 114. Uh, East 122nd Street was probably the first Afro Boricua, Fernando. I mean, there was a few uh, Afro Boricuas there, there were there. I don't know if they necessarily identified as such, but clearly I knew that we we came uh, in different variations and that, you know, um, that we arrived from different parts of the diaspora, different parts of the archipelago, different parts of the ancestral land, uh, different parts of the indigenous land, and which really made us beautiful at the end uh, of the day. But, but I think the first, if I would have to say the first Afro Boricua writer that I met was Peter Tomas. And, you know, I had, you know, the relationship I had with Peter Tomas was, was really interesting. Um, you know, um, you know, hearing him uh, when I was a kid, I was all in my twenties. I had just written Nigga Rican Blues, which is a poem I don't read anymore at all. Uh, because of Perry Thomas in many ways. And um, I remember going to Hunter College and Suhair Hamad had said, you need to come down here like right now because Peter Tomas is here. And I remember I had a jacket and tie on. I used to work at a literary agency downtown for Marie Brown. And um, I went and there he was, there was Peter Tomas and he was reading. And he said, I want to read a poem first by Pedro Pietri. He wrote Puerto Rican obituary. The, that was the second poem he wrote. But the first poem I want to read is by a young poet who I think is here tonight, and he read Nigga Rican Blue. And I was like, oh shit, Perry Thomas is reading my poem. Bro, and he messed the poem up, bro. He, he, you know, Perry Perry, but he did a, he, he, he did a bad up job, right? And, but I was like, damn, he's reading the poem. He's reading my poem. Now I'm in my 20s. Over 25 years, I'm having a difficult relationship, not only with the poem, because for so many reasons, that will take up a whole nother conversation. Benchmark, use of the N-word and so on and so forth. Um, but with Peter Tomas too, kind of looking at relationships between younger and older writers, how does that sort of play out? 25 years later almost, Peter Tomas has dementia. And I'm in his living room in El Cerrito, California. And he's sitting in a reading chair and he says uh, uh, he has a cane and he's looking out to the mountains and he says and he called everybody he loved Negrito I think Pedro said you know to be called Negrito is to be called love right and he says Negrito he says read me that poem and as soon as he as soon as he said read me that poem I'm like I know he's gonna ask for he's gonna ask for Negrito Blues I know it and to tell you that a poem has a life journey, bro, 25 years from that moment that he read it to me at Hunter. And all the incarnations of that poem on video, over music, at live audiences, coming back, and now I'm reading it back to him with someone whose memory has been a little compromised, but he remembered that poem. Bro, the poem had a life cycle of its own. I was at peace with the poem. Perry, all of it after after that. In fact, I went to, to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and do Nick, he, he, who invited me to read, he was like, yo, I want you to read that poem. I'm like, bro, it's not gonna happen, man. 
I'm not going to read that poem, but Perry was the one that really, you know, he was that the first Afro Boricua, Afro Puerto Rican who understood what it meant to be from East Harlem, who understood what it meant to be black, who understood what it meant to be Puerto Rican, who understood that sort of, you know, trying to become a man in a place like Ed Barrio during the time that he came, he said, I don't know if I can do this without having to go through some hell. That was powerful for me. So to answer, to answer that question, it would have to be, you know, Piri Tomas without question, you know. What an incredible story. I hope you write your memoir sometime and that that story uh, figures prominently because it's incredible as a piece of our culture, right? But as a, your, your own kind of personal and social history. Um, I think we're, you know, we're a little short on time. So I wonder, would you be willing to do, uh, uh, if I um, give you a couple of questions together and try to answer them together? Sure, sure, I'll try my best. Okay, so the first one is from Juan Santiago. There's a resurgence of Puerto Rican slash Neo Rican poetry that emerged post Hurricane Maria and post hashtag Renuncia. What can newer poets take as lessons from the poets of the 90s and early 2000s? So that's the first question from Juan. And the second question from uh, Ben Ortiz is question for Willie. I had the pleasure of hearing you read a poem recently in which you included many references to hip hop artists and experiences, particularly in the 70s and 80s. I would love to hear more reflections on how being a participant in the hip hop community shaped your Latino identity in a broad sense, but also as Afro, Bori, New Rican. Yeah, I think the yeah. lessons that you learn from older poets basically is, is that you have to sort of read those poets to see where might you want to develop your voice. So imagine yourself and, you know, big rest in peace to um, um, Tito Matos, by the way, right? Um, the idea of, of the musicianship and what that meant and how many lexicons he had coming in when he played, uh, when he did his plan, all right? Um, think about you're in a jam session and you're in a jam session with a bunch of other poets. I like to think that if you put 10 poets on the table and you're listening to the albums, that you go to one poet, another poet, another poet, by the time you hit uh, Willy Perdomo, you know it's Willy Perdomo's work just based on the sound of it, based on the diction, based on the use of lyric, based on what the book is being, is conversing with at that moment. So in other words, you are a voice in that jam session. And as you, as you come into that, when it's your time to come in and play, what is it you wanna say and how do you wanna say it that hasn't been said before? Or how is it building off what's been said before, but with now, to answer Ben's question, a native tongue. The idea of how is your sound? How is your scratch? How is that feeling that I think it was a, a large professor when, when, when he was talking about um, a tribe called Quest? What's it feel like when you listen to an album? It feels like you're putting your feet into a brand new pair of sneakers, right? Like that, that moment where that feeling that you get, you know you are in a new, new space, right? So that's the thing that you really want to think about. Um, and your relationship to the lessons you learn from the poet, but it's just not po poets who are teaching you those lessons. It's the music, it's the artwork by Pepon, Pepon Osorio, it's the photographs by Frank Espada, it's you know, the poem by Sandra Maria Esteves that really are all coming to join you as you step to the mic and you are about to deliver uh, your poem. And you can be abstract, you can be conscious, you can be gangster, you can be reflective, you can be completely experimental, but all of it has to make room in your vernacular, I think. And that's really the lesson that you want to learn. Hola, oh, Joanna and Willie, thank you very much for this conversation. Sadly, thank you, man. 
cut it off. Uh, but it's been a pleasure. Great cafecito. Maybe we will need to do a second part. Uh, I hope before, so, before we go, we want to express our solidarity with the claims that teachers are doing in Puerto Rico. Uh, we are with you. So thank you very much for tuning in. We will see you next week with Dalma Llanos, February 15th. Thank you very much, you all. Thank you. <laughs>